Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We're happy you could join us for the next hour of answering those gardening questions. If you'd like to submit a question and a picture to one of our future shows, just send us an email, byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live in the state or outside the state. Give us as much information as you can and tell us all about your question. A few good pictures of the problem really also help us give you a better answer. Also be sure to keep up with Backyard Farmer during the week on those social media channels, YouTube, Facebook, all those good places. Let's start with samples. Jody, you brought an ice cream carton and something tubular. Yes, so what I am gonna to describe today are the lives of uh, one of my favorite insects, the solitary bee and the leafcutter bee. And a lot of people have seen commercial bee houses or bee hotels that people make on their own. And so this display is kind of like recycled items and things you can use for existing cavities because some of these solitary bees will nest in things that are like tunnels that are already there. And they have to be a certain diameter and a certain depth. So it depends, I guess, each solitary bee that nests in these cavities, it's really about where they're nesting and what materials they're using. So this tubular object here is an example of what happens in these tubes because people are always curious of what happens. So right now, uh, they overwinter in one of these um, tunnels. So this is representative of this and you can see the different sections. And so these are each different cells that the bee is developing in. So right now they're still a larvae. But what happens is the bee, so this is my, let's just say this is my leaf cutter bee, in an empty tube would collect leaves or whatever nesting material, get inside the tube, put it in there, then go and uh, collect pollen, lay an egg, and seal up that with the nesting material. And this could be petals, leaves, wool, uh, mud, depending on what kind of bee. And so when these are all filled, they'll actually, this is the actual size of each of those cells. So one of these tubes here, um, the nests can have seven or eight um, developing uh, bees. But we, when we're making them ourselves, we want them to be a certain depth because the, uh, the mother bee is able to determine the sex of her offspring. So she puts the females at the back and the males up at the front because they're dispensable if there's predators. <laughs> and in the spring, I know it's appalling, the males will emerge first. So they will chew their way out and the males will emerge and wait for the females at the back and then mate. And then they will start the new colony or their new uh, nest. And that's why when you finally get the leafcutter bees there, they'll stay there if you continue to have food for them and uh, safe nesting places for them. That's awesome. And so when we get our very first leaf cutter bee questions because of holes in the rose leaves, we're gonna remind people they're good yeah. guys. So. Cool, not so good a guy, Rock. What do you have? No, and it's tis the season. I mean, you know, this, we bust up and open in the spring and everyone gets really excited, but winter annuals are a weed that actually doesn't, don't grow during the winter. They germinate in the fall. Uh, much like winter wheat and out throughout western and central Nebraska. And then they, they either sit as a rosette or a very small plant that doesn't do anything. And then they come out in the spring and then they come on with a vengeance. This is, this is henbit, one of our real common ones. They're, they are annuals, but they pop in the, in the fall and then finish their life cycle in the spring. You know, unfortunately, that's what we're seeing right now. They grow faster than the lawn. They grow in the landscape bed. It, you know, if you're getting ready to get your uh, vegetable garden ready, John, of course, you start seeing them in there. And you go by some fields, especially those that don't practice minimum tillage, they're just purple. And it's a gorgeous look, but unfortunately, that means that they're going to be a ton of seed in the ground. Um, this happens to be a member of the mint family, so it has a square stem, a very characteristic tubular, um, tubular. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> that must be the word of the night, but a, a trumpet shaped uh, flower at the end and they can be very, very, very aggressive. The good news is, is they're relatively easy to control. The bad news is they should be controlled in the fall with a pre-emergent herbicide, a preen compound or something like that, which is not one we typically say to put a pre-emergent down, but for the winter annuals like henbit and chickweed and others, 
Um, it's better to control in the spring. Controlling them now actually causes a metabolic disorder and they produce more seeds. So you think you're getting them and they burn down and you're really happy and then next year, they're, they're, all their offspring are there with friends. So uh, try not to control them too aggressively now. They can be hand pulled before they actually set seed, but any chemical application at this point in time is really not a good idea. Excellent, thank you, Rock. John, the sample is bigger than we are. Right. So this uh, is a friend of mine that sits in the corner of my home office. Uh, <laughs> so we know that vegetable gardens, there's been a big craze. Also in the gardening world, houseplants have had a big craze. Um, and there wasn't a lot of vegetables that I could show you right now. <laughs> right. It's still a little cool for that. So I thought I would show you this. So <clears throat> this is an interesting plant uh, because it's actually uh, one that uh, is very valuable that I didn't realize. So I actually inherited it. I um, sort of uh, rescued it. And you can see this variegation on the leaves. This is a Monstera albo, so it's a tropical vine plant. And I took a picture of it and was sharing it with people online, and they all wanted to buy parts of it. And I had no idea why. Uh, and so I actually uh, sold, I, I cut off some leaves from the top. You can see this new growth coming on here. That's after I cut off. Uh, and I sold five leaves, so five leaves with a part of stem on there because of that variegation, and I made $875 from those five leaves. So if I sold this whole plant, it would be well worth over a thousand bucks. If I did them leaf by leaf, I could probably make more. Uh, and that's just a little bit, you know, there are five new, brand new houseplant shops in, in Omaha alone, like mom and pop small. Uh, there was wow. one that opened this week um, by one of the garden centers. Wow. Uh, and so um, houseplants are hot, the prices are going up, and it's crazy to see, especially younger people, like millennials and younger, are going houseplant crazy. And so this is my retirement plan uh, right here, or maybe a yacht, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and you know, it, it does get special treatment. Um, you know, we were talking about cameras and automation before, so this has a sensor that links to my phone. It tells me when it needs water and you know, when it needs fertilizer <laughs> and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I figured I would splurge on, on my little plant friend there. I, th I think instead you need a ring doorbell because now people know it's in your office and it's not going to be there very long. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks all. Rock, you get, or Jody, you get the first set of questions. This is from Nickerson. Um, this, is, uh, this is a viewer who, unfortunately, she has uh, a hive that has died. She wants to know how to clean it to prepare for, you know, doing, getting a queen, <coughs> doing those kinds of things. She says, it looks like those that were in the hives seem to have died while they were doing their jobs. So what do, you, what do you think here? Okay, so I have to tell you that I'm not a honeybee specialist. There is, a, like, there is the UNL Bee Lab with Dr. Judy Woosmart who they do a lot of workshops and trainings. They're great at that. But I did talk to her about how to prepare and clean out a hive, and she said that that hive actually does not need to be cleaned out. Those combs are good the way they are. That if you put in a new colony, they are amazing, and they can clean it up, fix it up, tidy it up, all the wonky combs, and she's good to go. So if you have more questions, I would recommend calling uh, Dr. Judy Woosmart and the UNLB lab. All right, excellent. That's probably something that our viewer will be glad well, to I hear. Well, I have no idea, Yeah, because I've never seen the inside of it a dead hive, so. <laughs> All right, Rock, you have uh, several lawn questions, as you can well imagine. The first is Gretna. This, this viewer says they have competing grass types, neither of which are doing well. If he overseeds, what you, would you suggest? And he is thinking about waiting until fall to overseed. Could he do it now? And then he's also saying he's been kind of stingy with his watering program. So there's a lot going on here. Um, it looks to me like there's a little bit of fescue and probably a little bit of bluegrass, which is not atypical of a lot of lawns. People had bluegrass, they shipped over to fescue because they thought tall fescue and they thought it would be better. Um, and so you've got some dominating more in some areas than others. Um, the stingy with the water though is the key here because we know our cool season grasses, especially in the heat of the summer, need water. Most consumers overwater their turf. In this particular instance, I'm gonna say being stingy with the water has probably caused them uh, the kind of stand loss that you see here. And there's some obvious traffic patterns. It looks like maybe they're not shifting their mower um, and going 
diagonally in different directions. So there's there's some tracking going on. So there's a lot going on in this particular picture, and we appreciate them showing this to us. But what, if you're going to overseed, then um, fall is always better with the cool season grasses like tall fescue and uh, creep and, and Kentucky bluegrass. Um, you can do it in the spring, but then you fight with the early warmer weather and weeds like crabgrass, et cetera. There are commercial products that are available that contain um, herbicides that can keep the crabgrass and other things down, but it's still not our recommended time to seed. The best time to seed is in the fall and then you don't fight those weeds. And also we really don't wanna be controlling weeds in the spring in and around the garden because they have trees that are emerging. We've got garden plants that are affected by these herbicides as well. So I'm gonna say wait until spring, go in with a good turf type tall fescue blend um, aerified in a couple directions, broadcast the seed, and then don't be my miser with the water. I mean, you admitted it, but let's let's try to break that habit just to get it established. And then in the up upcoming years in Gretna, you may only have to water that two to three times a year because you went with the fescue, which has a deep drought resistant root system. All right, and when you say fall, you mean mid-August-ish. Yeah, fall is not October, sorry. Thank you, Kim, I appreciate right. that. But we're talking about when the, the days start to get a little bit shorter into August and uh, nighttime temperatures get a little cooler um, and, and th that's when you do it. So it's really mid to late August, no later with tall fescue until, uh, it, no later than September 15th. So that you've got a month there of a window to get the ground ready and to go for it. Excellent, thanks, Rock. Your, your next one is Grand Island. Um, this is a hard packed area uh, and I think it's the next one, NET, because those two kind of went together. There we go. Ouch. Yes, exactly. This is Grand Island, hard packed area on the east side of the house. Wonder, they wonder what can be done with it. it the, the maples, the silver maples are 41 years old. The soil is eroding. They've tried to shade grass. The rest of the, the yard is bluegrass. They do want to know if they could sod it or should they cover that area with soil and start over again? Um, you know, I appreciate the viewers coming up with suggestions, but in this case, you have silver maples and silver maples are just ground desiccators, right? They, they suck the moisture out, they're shallow rooted, covering them both up with dirt, just make the roots grow up back up to that level. So you could throw a foot of dirt on here and it's not gonna do it, the silver maple that's 41 years old. Um, you know, there's a lot going on here. Obviously they get some runoff from the from the sidewalk there that washes it out and that sort of thing. I know they mentioned, at least I believe you mentioned it or if not, I remember reading it, but they don't wanna put a mulch under there. That densest shade, you know, I'm surprised they actually have any grass growing under there, especially since they implied that it was bluegrass. Um, that's just barely surviving. And they could certainly spend a ton of money on sod only to have to do it again within a year or two, mm -hmm. simply because this is a really hostile environment. And we know that trees and turf do not compete well together. And whatever was planted first, you know, you got a new uh, development and they planted turf and then people stick trees in that they bought on sale. Those trees always suffer. The reverse is also true, trying to establish grass post established shade developers like a silver maple that are known to suck soils dry right at the surface because they're you know they're they're not that water conserving right they they use a lot of water and then the turf just never has a chance so i would not recommend sodding that and uh, even with the aversion to using mulch i mean unless they have a reason to do turf because they have kids playing on it or whatever it really is not even a super shade mix is not going to work in that really really hostile environment so i wish i had better news from the first picture they show there was some Lawn striping that we mentioned earlier in the in the show, um, and I, I don't that's not a good enough picture for me to tell whether there's a contaminant in there, but there's definitely a lot going in in that picture, and it looks like maybe an aerification. It's in a little more in full sun, some aerification and fertilizer, and um, keep an eye on any weeds that might develop, and then send us another picture. All right, thanks, Rock. All right, John, uh, this is a Polk, Nebraska viewer. You have a couple pictures here. They said after their eight inches of rain and hard winds for three days, they have two-year-old Taylor junipers. They're leaning. Uh, they wanna know whether they should try to stake them or will they straighten themselves up? So for those, I would go ahead and take a look at those and try to stake them, you know, to move them up. You know, they are two, two years old, uh, so they should start getting established. They're not quite there yet, uh, and so they can move around. I also notice it looks like you've got the some sort of ring around them or they're sunk in a pot, and I'm not sure that I like that. Um, <laughs> just because that can be really restrictive, especially as the tree gets older, uh, and so that can affect their growth. So I would take a look at that as well, look at their planting. But yeah, you can probably stick them back upright and stake them up and 
you know, that might hold them for the next wind or it might not. <laughs> okay, thanks, John. And your next picture is a viewer from Bennington. Uh, she planted two clump heritage birch last year and she's wondering about the spacing of the trunks in the clumps. Um, about halfway up the trunk on this one, this, they're only two inches apart already. So she's wondering about a spacer or leave it to nature or should she take one of those out? I would probably take one of those out. So I would look at the shape of that and look at the base of them to see how close they are at the bottom uh, because as they get bigger, they're gonna grow into each other and that can create problems. So looking at that, you know, we see some going off to the right and some off to the left and there's one that sort of crosses from the right to the left. I think I would definitely look at taking that one out because we have that, that growth pattern, things will cross over and maybe one or two others uh, that I would take out. So um, yeah, prune that out, uh, shape that up and that should be uh, nice for you in the future. All right, thank you, John. Well, year in and year out, one of our more popular topics in the spring is turf. People want that grass to green up, to be weed free and to stay that way all season long. So here with a few spring turf tips is Bill Kreuzer. Spring is here and we're all really excited about it. But sometimes we can get a little bit too excited when we're doing our spring lawn care. Everybody wants to get outside and, and start doing things to the lawn to help get summer to be here faster. And unfortunately, that's not always the best thing to do. And for spring lawn care, the key word is patience. We want to let things start to regrow, resume growth naturally before we start over fertilizing, water, over mowing. Uh, you know, it's easy to get out there and want to do different cultural practices, uh, but let's just wait for that grass to really start growing um, to a level that we normally would expect. So let's get into some, into some specifics. Mowing. Let's mow when the grass tells us we need to mow. Ideally, we want to be mowing to about three inches, and so we let the grass go to about four and a half inches and then mow. In the summertime, an ideal growth rate would be about once a week. So you want to be growing about one and a half new inches of leaves a week. But when it's the, the, uh, the spring, it takes time for those leaves to grow. And so it might be two, three weeks before, between those first mowings. And then later in the spring, the grass will grow like crazy and you might need to mow more than weekly. And that brings me on to our next point, fertilizer. This is why we don't want to fertilize too early because it won't do much for the grass now. It will sit in the soil, and then when the grass is warm enough and ready to grow, it's gonna grow so fast, you won't be able to keep up with your mowing requirements. No one wants to mow every two or three days in the middle of the spring. So you might think, okay, well, when should I fertilize? I need to put my pre-emergent uh, uh, herbicide down. If you need to do that application and you don't want to put fertilizer down, there are products that are just the pre-emergence herbicides. Otherwise, you could uh, wait a little bit longer. We are still very early in the pre-emergence window, generally mid to late April. For much of Nebraska is a fairly appropriate time to make those applications. If you go too early, you might need to make a second application in June because the products won't last for the entire summer. When it comes to other cultural practices, things like aeration, you know, those can be done, but let's, again, let that grass start to resume growth. And then other types of cultural practices like power raking, things that are really gonna beat up the, that turf, we really wanna back that down until that growth rate uh, starts to pick up. So when the growth rate ramps up, then you can start to use those more aggressive cultivation practices. So those are some of the big things to think about in the spring, and in doing so, uh, you're setting yourself up for a really healthy lawn in 2021. So the key message is take your time, be patient, let that grass get going all by itself for a while and you will be glad. There's been a lot of mowing in our neighborhood so that grass must have grown fast. And people get in a hurry to, put, to start mowing and to put their pre-emergent out and to be overly aggressive just like right. um, Bill said. It just, it, it's, you know, if you mow it, it's going to want to grow. <laughs> Okay, I'll keep that in mind. All right, Jody, uh, this is a viewer from Lincoln. She discovered a bunch of tiny larvae and worms. She sent us a couple of pictures. She wonders what they are. Okay, so these are elm leaf beetles, but 
it's a different part of the life cycle than the adult. So this is actually the prepupa. So, and there are many prepupae. So what happens is it overwinters as an adult, it comes out, lays eggs, they hatch, they emerge as larvae, they feed on the leaves. And so they'll skeletonize the leaves. The adults will create little shot holes. So if you have an elm tree that may be above where you found these prepupae, then um, they may have holes in it. And what they usually do is what they say in the books is that they crawl down the trunk to pupate in this, in, around the trunk but these guys probably just fell out. It's probably easier to get to the ground that way, but then they're not close to the trunk, so who knows? But that's what they are. So hopefully, well, there should be an elm tree. It's probably American or what's the other Siberian. one? Siberian elm yeah. that are most susceptible. All right, Jody. and then your next one is a spider ID from Bellevue. Uh, they always pick the same tree. They weave this really cool web, grow to the size of a dime. What is this? Yeah, so this, we call these spiny orb weavers. They're so cute. This is a female spiny orb weaver. The, the genus is Microphena, and that's from the, like, Athena, goddess of, like, arts and crafts for her spinning and weaving. So the cool thing about this spider is that, you know, they should return if she has a, an egg sac close by. It's usually off to the side of the web. Um, the males are not as, as attractive as she is. But, and, and they're not gonna be in the web. They'll be in the vegetation somewhere. But the cool thing about this spider is a lot of them will uh, wrap their prey and then bite it. Um, Microthena will bite, bite it and then wrap it. Did I say it the right way? Mm -hmm. She does it the different than the other ones. Well, and he did say he's seen three or four of these every year for about six years, yeah, so. so. Must be like a wooded area. I don't see them in urban areas as much, but I do see them in, in, in the woods and stuff like that. It's very cool. Very cool, you're right. All right, Rock, um, weeds. This is Utica. Um, this is a, these weeds have given this person grief for the past five years, spreads rapidly, usually growing around shrubs and turf, but then it goes into other areas. He's pulled, he's sprayed, it wilts, and then it comes right back. It gets more prolific. And I think we have, do we have two pictures on that one, I think? Yeah, we're on the close. second one now. We went through yeah. them, right? So, so that's mm -hmm. chickweed or common chickweed, excuse me. Mm -hmm. There is a mouse ear chickweed that's not real common in Nebraska, which is actually a perennial, uh, but we don't see it much, thank God, because up in Michigan where I went to school, it, it can be much more aggressive. But just as they describe, it tends to take, you know, there's not a lot of mulch in that ground there, so you probably could have done a, done a job of weed control. It's a winter annual, like the hen bit we showed you earlier. So it germinates in the fall of the year. It's there as a really small, plant then it overwinters and then it pops right now it's going to get ready to flower I think I can see some small buds on there it'll come out with a white flower and then every every one of those capsules um, can produce anywhere from 50 to 150 seeds I wouldn't have one have been the student that had to count those but regardless um, you know and they'll be 70 to 100 200 fl flowers on that thing so every time you don't control it or do something about it then you pop out more seed once again, winter annuals are best controlled in the fall with a pre-emergence herbicide. Um, they indicated that this was in primarily in landscape beds. I think it's how you described that. So that said, you certainly want to uh, consider using a product like Preen in the fall. That won't harm your later plantings in the um, in the spring that you're gonna be putting in, in landscape beds. And if you've got mostly perennials and shrubs, you can definitely use that wall to wall in, in the um, fall of the year. Uh, spraying, once again now, is not recommended because of number one, it's not gonna be very effective. You aggravate the plant, it gets very upset and it produces more offspring. And you've got a lot of emerging plants that are gonna be injured by a broadleaf herbicide application. So not much you can do now, but just be patient, get some more mulch down because that's a pretty weak mulch patch there. Um, and mulch underneath the ornamentals. Um, also consider using a a, a standard pre-emergent in the spring, in, excuse me, in the fall, in the lawn as well if it's moved into the lawn. All right, thank you, Rock. And your next one is this weed sprung up along the bare, bare west side of the building and it's grown fast to fill in all the space. It's also in the lawn. They wanna know what it is and how to, to get rid of it. Um, yeah, this- I got a couple pictures on this one. Yeah, there's too. another one there, yep. there as well. Yeah, this is Pennycress. Um, it must be winter annual night on Backyard Farmer. <laughs> um, because this is also a winter annual. It, you don't see the flower, the prolific flower production that you do with say the henbit we showed you initially as my sample or with the chickweed that we just showed you um, that is also in this area. But th this area has a lot of uh, 
obviously has a lot of annuals. It's a rosette right now, then it's gonna pop this real long stalk. That stalk is gonna disperse that seed all over. So you see it's not as dense as the chickweed because of the nature of the seed dispersal, but it also is very aggressive and can shade out lawn and the area. That's a pretty dry piece of ground. You look at that picture, right? And there's mm -hmm. a lot of cracks in the, in the, in the soil. So, um, you know, when you get ready to plant whatever it is you're gonna plant or propagate those, you might wanna consider a little bit of moisture. You know, those freeze cracks should have been gone by now considering the amount of uh, rain we had. But once again, that's a fall application of preen in the landscape bed or something similar in the turf bed, but it's fall as opposed to spring. Thank you, Rock. You almost said dirt. We're gonna to have to bring out the swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, this is a Ravenna viewer. But did I say it, John? I don't think I did. <laughs> she, uh, she started her tomatoes from seed for the first time. They're, stall, they're tall, they're spindly, they're leaning over. She wonders what to do to get them to stand up straight. She did use a heat mat. She did stop after the, they came up. Right. Well, you know, you have to real, realize that these are tiny little babies. Like these are just fresh out of the seed. Uh, and so they're gonna be really tiny and spindly like that until they get some growth on them. And you did the, the right thing. So most people, they use the heat mat and they leave the seeds on there. But actually after they're up like this, you wanna remove them from the heat because that slows down the growth and gives them a stronger growth. If you leave them on the heat, they're going to get really leggy and spindly. Uh, the only other thing that you can do is make sure you have plenty of light. So you, if you don't have a, a really, really bright sunny window with like six to eight hours of direct light, you'll want to provide some sort of light for them, uh, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours of a good plant light. Uh, but really, those are just teeny tiny little babies and just like little babies, they can't support themselves. Right. Uh, and so they'll, they'll get stronger as time goes by. All right, and don't overwater. That is correct. Over, overwatering is the number one cause of death of any container plant, Excellent. including seedlings. All right, thank you, John. Well, we were fortunate to have some very nice weather last week that did allow us to get some cool season crops going in our garden. It's time now to hear from Terry James for an update for the Backyard Farmer Garden. Week in the backyard farmer garden it has been a busy week both outdoors and indoors more of our seeds have grown big enough that we were able to move them up into the next size container so we're getting ready and getting those little baby seeds ready for our, to plant later in may in our garden uh, we've also done some great work outside we've started edging all of our landscape beds uh, that really helps define your bed and gives you that real de definition between the path and the bed. Uh, we also got our potatoes planted. So we have our seed potatoes that are ready in our garden. So we're gonna be excited when those start popping up out of the garden growing and be able to harvest those later this summer. And we started the second set of uh, planting for our um, cool season crops. So we put some more peas in, some more lettuces in, um, some more radishes in. So we're gonna kind of stagger some of that growing and be able to kind of extend that. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. The tulips really put on a show this week also, and it won't be long before we have some other ornamentals popping with color. Mm -hmm. Right now, it is time for the lightning round, and I think maybe no lightning outside, finally. Right. All right, John, are you ready? Born ready. <laughs> okay, we have a viewer who wants to know whether she can plant her potatoes in old tires, or is that toxic? I wouldn't do it. It can give off toxic stuff. All right. We have an... <laughs> Keep going, keep going, come on, <laughs> get up. <laughs> we have an Ord viewer who wants to know whether they can use wood ash uh, from their wood stove on asparagus beds and when to do that. No. All right, how about Roundup on the asparagus bed? You can do that before the asparagus emerges. All right, this is a Bolus Nebraska viewer who is moving from, north, uh, from Nebraska to Tennessee. She wants to take all of her very old iris. When does she do that? Uh, you can dig them up whenever they're dormant, um, so before they come up or after they die back. All right, uh, this is an Omaha viewer who wants to know whether it's the right time to plant gladiolas and dahlias, or is it too early? It's still a little early, wait a few weeks. All right, um, we have a Holders viewer who wants to know whether they can use 
preen in a strawberry bed to take care of crabgrass? No. <laughs> <laughs> or read the label. Pass. Pass. <laughs> yeah, some of the preen products are labeled for um, strawberries. <laughs> you get that one from John. <laughs> That's his subtraction point. Well, All I right. get a bonus since you took like 20 minutes to give me one question. You made us laugh. That's on you, bud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rock, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Wilbur viewer who wants to know whether you can use a crabgrass preventative on buffalo grass. Yes. All right. This is a Cozad viewer who wants to know the best way to remove the old tops of buffalo grass um, from the new growth. And can you mow short, basically? Um, you can actually mow it down short, or not right now, but in about two to three weeks, right when it starts to green up. You can down, mow down short to get the top growth off, um, not scalp to the ground, but you know, rather than mow it three and a half, four inches, you can mow it at two. All right. How many steps should there really be in a lawn step program? I would have to ask the viewer what kind of lawn do they want. The four step program produces the very emerald, very traditional, you know, English garden type lawn, but if you're willing to not tolerate or not have that level of quality, then a, then a one step or a two step program can be equally valuable. All right, um, Bermuda grass, how do you get rid of it? Move. <laughs> Ox. <laughs> <laughs> it's round up and spray and then round up and spray and then round up and spray and, and then you're still not going to get rid of it. So then move. Then move. Okay. All right. He distracted you. <laughs> That's right. John has you off your game. It's called, it's called strategy. Uh, <laughs> okay. To win this non-existent Jody, trophy. Jody, ignore okay. what's going on over here. Are you ready? <clears throat> yes. This is a viewer who, who has a raised bed and an ant colony has nested in it. She wants to move the colony carefully. Is that possible? No. All right. This I is, like these questions. <laughs> this is a viewer who says they have tiny white insects in their house plants and she used mosquito bits several times, but it didn't do any good. Mosquito bits will only work for fly larvae. So if it's fungus gnats, it would work. If it's not fungus gnats, it won't work. All right. Um, is there a systemic treatment for Japanese beetles that can be put down now so they're not so bad next year? Uh, I wouldn't do it now, but there is. It's active ingredient imidacloprid, but read the label. Because? Because you can't use it on lindens. Excellent. Uh, this is a, an urban gardener who loves milkweed, butterfly milkweed and others but hates the aphids. Is there anything they can do that is not chemical based to control the aphids? Uh, spray it with a, the hose like every day because they will just keep coming back. All right, a Brownville, Brownville viewer has white pines that have white stuff on the needles. What do you use and when? Um, it could be pine needle scale. Mm -hmm. um, when there's the crawlers. Okay, perfect, nice job all even though there was a little distraction. <clears throat> John. I didn't distract Jody. No. <laughs> All right, plants the of the week. cone of silence, <laughs> boom. <laughs> All right, plants of the week. <laughs> so our plants of the week, we have some prairie smoke here. Uh, it's a lovely native. I'll pull that out so you can see that a little bit better as we uh, come up. Uh, flowers in threes, uh, interesting. Plants typically have uh, numbers of three, fours, or fives that they flower and have flower parts. It's really interesting. So if you can count to three, four, or five. <laughs> you've uh, got it made. You're, you've got it made. Um, so smoke is the, the seed head. Uh, you know, it sort of looks like that, that hazy purpley color, but it'll really look like smoke whenever after it flowers and you've got the seeds. Um, and the, the lobed leaves have really, really fine hairs. Uh, so that's a native uh, full sun to part shade plant. And then also we have um, Mcdenia, right? Correct, mm -hmm. right? So she has to feed me these answers because I'm the vegetable person and I, you know. Um, that's not a vegetable. Right, it's not a vegetable. Yeah. I won't try to eat it, it could be toxic, who knows. <laughs> um, so this is a clump forming plant, uh, partial to full shade. Uh, obviously early flowering because you know, it's early April and we've got flowers, uh, these nice little white flowers here. Uh, and it has a uh, deep red fall color. Uh, and so that's uh, two of our plants of the week. So they have nice, they're nice now, they'll be even nicer later on. Exactly, thank you so much. All right, Jody, questions. 
This is uh, an Omaha viewer that says their magnolia had those large scales last year and while it bloomed this spring, the bark is black. Do you treat for the scales now and with what? And then you've got a second picture from a viewer who has a magnolia in a pretty bad location probably. Uh, southwest side, new construction, poor soil. Would that contribute to scale insects? Yeah, in so general. yeah, the environmental stress on that plant will make it more susceptible to damage, insect damage, disease. So if you could move it to a different place where it has some shade some part of the time and maybe better soil. But the scale insects, so I think I was on the last show in October and mm -hmm. in that time was the time to treat like September, October for the crawlers. And so I don't know if the viewer treated for the crawlers at that time. And if you did, that's good. You wanna keep an eye out. But that the black bark, that's from the city mold that develops because the soft scales uh, release honeydew. And it gets sticky, the mold gets there. Um, you can try to scrub that off. Today I was working on the main magnolias out here um, that they were covered last year. Um, the dormant oil will not work because you have to use that before bud break and since they've already flowered, the next option you can use is a systemic, but I would do that after all the petals drop so that you do not um, cause any harm to pollinators. Excellent, thank you, Jody. All right, you have three pictures from multiple viewers of what is this tan grass? Sort of wiry, it seems to spread really fast. There was one patch last year, now it's every place. This viewer is next to a park and they don't mow along the path. It flops in those places. They wanna know, will it green up or should they get rid of it? And this is from Blair. Yeah, this is nimble will. It's a warm season grass, like earlier in the speed round we talked about, um, you know, Bermuda grass. Although there is a control for nimble will and um, it, it's, you know, it's, you're gonna get a sticker shock when you go online to get the product. It's called mesotrione or mesotrione. Um, that product is a very good on this. You're gonna need two to three applications in the spring followed by, you know, right after it greens up and then two to three in late summer. And you should get about 95% control. Um, when you buy the product, don't freak out because of cost because it's, you know, you don't put it down at a very high rate. And so therefore, you know, you get more bang for your buck. There is also a product from the Scott's miracle Grow company that has mesotrione in it that's used as a starter fertilizer. And we know people have tried to use this on uh, nimble will, but unfortunately they end up putting on about eight pounds of nitrogen in addition to that because it has nitrogen as part of the carrier. So that's, that's strongly not recommended because your lawn doesn't need, you know, it doesn't need eight pounds. It barely needs two to two and a half on a normal in a normal year. So yeah, clearly stay away from that grant. That's a great starter product for, you know, a, a cool season new lawn or something like that, but it's not a great product for trying to control it. So mesotrione or tenacity is the trade name of the Syngenta product available online. Uh, you won't see it. Some of the co-ops will carry it or order it for you, but generally you're not gonna find it in your local garden store and definitely not in your box stores. All right, thank you, Rock. All right, John, this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, they have um, golden privet and boxwood, both of which are on the east side of the house. They get morning sun and afternoon shade. Several of the boxwoods look like this, and only a few branches on the second one on the golden privet have any foliage at all. Should they be pruned? They're over 10 years old. They've always done great. They did get plenty of water. Is this, what is this? Well, even though they got plenty of water, this still looks like winter damage, which is most, most often caused by drying out. You know, the, the winter air is dry and the, you know, the wind blows. Uh, and so we still get that. So it could have been, you know, when we have warm winter days, things warm up and it uses all the water. And so for what's winter damaged on those, um, you know, the boxwood, you know, you would want to prune that out. With this one here that we're seeing on the screen right now, you know, you'd have to see what comes out to see what you would prune. But, you know, if you look at any of the twigs and they snap rather than bend, mm -hmm. it's a goner. Uh, and so you would want to prune that back. Or, you know, if you're, if you're having this constantly, you might want to think about something different to do there. All right, and you, you have a, a third one, and this is a Midtown Omaha viewer. They planted the dwarf Alberta spruce in September, southern exposure. They're looking like this. They were watered regularly and they used an antidesiccant in the winter. Yeah, so still this is winter damage. So that really didn't do anything. 
uh, for you there, and you know, really, it's a crapshoot. Um, what when you're looking at evergreens like this, you have to realize that anytime the entire branch turns brown, there's nothing ever going to come back out of it. Uh, and so you, if you prune off all the brown and you see something weirdly shaped and you don't like it anymore, you know, it's not going to be something that you're going to be in love with. You also have to remember that these guys grow very slowly. And so all that damage has taken off several years of growth. So it's going to be a tiny little uh, plant and take a lot longer to get up to any size. So you might want to think about that. You know, you can prune it out and see what, where it goes, but you probably aren't going to be happy with that in the long term. Excellent. All right. Thank you, John. Well, last year was rough on a lot of our local businesses. The garden center industry was particularly hard hit due to the influx of millions of new gardeners and a shortage of quarantined workers. So what can we expect this season? Here's Randy Wolf from Campbell's Nursery here in Lincoln to talk about pandemic gardening supplies. Come springtime, you might find yourself in the garden center uh, looking at a large selection of plants, uh, many of which you uh, might want to take home and plant in your garden. Uh, what you don't always realize about something like that is uh, this takes some time to, to get this plant to the garden center. Uh, we order our, our supplies in July, the previous year. Uh, these things start coming in almost immediately. Uh, some plants are, are coming in in the fall, some in the early in the spring uh, or even late winter. Uh, all this has to be planned out. Uh, if we don't plan correctly, we're short on sh uh, soil, we're sh short on pots. Uh, sometimes uh, we, have to, we, we have a hard time uh, getting past those mistakes. So uh, we're very fastidious about uh, our planning and uh, try and have everything here. Some things that are out of our control though are things like transportation. Uh, sometimes we need a truckload of soil and we can't find a truck to get it here. Uh, other times we have weather that can give us problems. Uh, we've had uh, truckloads of plants held up because of snowstorms recently. We've had uh, plants that have um, stayed too long on trucks that were unheated and were total loss. Those have to be replaced then at some, sort, some point in time. So um, all this uh, is, is part of getting them to Nebraska then we have to uh, make sure that they're uh, taken care of properly for uh, a number of months before they come to you and you can take them home and enjoy them in your garden. So uh, a lot of pre-planning, a lot of hard work goes into all this. The pandemic has, has been uh, a problem more with the hard goods side uh, where we're uh, not always be able to get uh, some of the plastic materials that we want. Um, or, or uh, packaging the, for, for different things. Uh, sometimes the, the product is there, but the, it's just, there's just no way to, to get it uh, boxed up into us. So uh, that, that has come, become a problem. Uh, the other problem has been, uh, sometimes it's been difficult to find labor, uh, but the flip side of the pandemic uh, coin is, is that uh, it uh, increased a lot of gardeners because a lot of people had time at home and, and uh, uh, we sure hope that uh, a lot of them enjoyed their, their gardening experiences last year so they can continue with that this year. We will see plant shortages uh, and it's, it's my belief that we will. Um, we're, we're finding that uh, some varieties are hard to find. We're finding that some varieties we can get, but not in the size that we want. Uh, so we en end up going with smaller plants and growing them longer or getting larger plants uh, that end up costing us more. Another thing that uh, we've seen is, is um, uh, our suppliers are telling us they need our orders uh, a lot further in advance than they used to. So we are actually ordering for 2022 at this point in time. And hopefully all of us and you will be able to get whatever you need for your beds and those vegetable gardens. It really was pretty skimpy last year. <laughs> Had to make do or make substitutions. All right, Jody, last uh, pictures. This is um, Sutton, Nebraska. These little dudes are tiny as the tip of a pen. How to kill them and what to keep them uh, from returning. So I okay. think you have two pictures. Yep, there's. Yep, and you know I have these little dudes at home too, <laughs> and so I'll I'll tell you a trick. But so these are clover mites, and mm. we can tell that they're clover mites because they have eight legs, and their four legs are like way longer than the rest. 
and they overwinter pretty much probably in the siding or close to the house. And then when it warmed up, they started getting active again. They accidentally get into homes. They're not going to live long in there, but they're enough to annoy us. People smash them. They leave streaks. They stain. People get mad, and then they call me. <laughs> but they feed on plants, and evidently the more fertilization in the turf, the more clover mites you may have. So when they get in the house, <clears throat> just vacuum them. You want to use the attachment that has a little brush um, on the windowsill. And then I use like little glue boards. Uh, don't use a good scissors. Use something that you don't mind getting sticky. But you just put that right up against like the, the crack in the windowsill because it's such a small little mite that you can't seal them out. And then they just get stuck to that. And I check it every day, and there's just more every day. But <laughs> after a few weeks, they're gone, and then they'll come back in the fall a little bit. The hottest time of year, they're non-existent. Um, but that's what I do. If you really want to spray outside, you can, but it, you're still going to have to continue to repeatedly spray when you see them, which will be every week. All right, thanks. Or just don't fertilize the turf or rip the turf out. Right. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. And a lot of people don't want to leave. <laughs> like, have no turf close anywhere you know, within two feet of your home. And so sometimes Who invited that's, you? <laughs> sometimes that's not realistic and it's not what people want to do, so. <laughs> All right, Jody. now you have a tree question, <laughs> which is from Oxford, Nebraska. This is a sycamore. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want to know what is ca causing these holes. Probably a woodpecker. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got woodpecker damage, they're looking for an insect. So if there's insect damage, it's usually a weak or a weak tree. Mm -hmm. um, and I just know from my horticulturist friends is that you probably should, if you want to, remove the rock and put in some wood mulch and monitor the canopy. I don't know what it, what this tree looks like overall, um, but you can keep it and just try to maintain it. But you know, have it have a better environment so that it can be happy and happier tree. All right, excellent. Okay, It'll be rock. A happy little tree with holes <laughs> in it. <laughs> yeah, this is a Falls City viewer. They bought this old property. They're saying it has some sort of clumpy grass, maybe a fescue, mostly it's clover and dandelions. How can they get rid of the weeds to plant good grass? And the, uh, apparently the whole strip looks like this. Yeah, so this is, I mean, it's not uncommon to move into a new property and they didn't take care of the lawn. And according to the John, they shouldn't. But anyway, that, regardless. <laughs> I see a lot of clover mites in there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but in this case, you know, they're going to have to start over from scratch. There's a lot going on here. That is a clump type fescue that they want to eradicate. Um, you know, they could spend the summer, you know, rototilling it up and spot spraying it, uh, but go in there and aggressively spray it out. Um, you know, if they can afford it, sod would be the way to go in a spring installation, but if they're willing to be patient and just mow these weeds off, then go with some um, early, sum late summer, excuse me, treatments, spray it with Roundup a couple of times, and then come in and overseed or reseed actually into the new planting bed. In the fall of the year, a turf type tall fescue in that area would be good. Um, some of the turf type tall fescues also come blended with a little bit of bluegrass just to give it some binder, and that's sort of, that's sort of what uh, seems to be the trend right now is a turf type tall fescue is the dominant grass, but a, a bluegrass is in there to bind, or in case we get winter kill, which can occur with tall fescue, then certainly the bluegrass does not winter kill under Nebraska conditions, and it can fill in those spots. So that's what I would suggest, but it's going to be Either they can hire a lawn care company or a landscaping company to come in and do that and take care of it um, and sod it uh, would be the quickest insta-lawn kind of thing. But at the same time, if they wanted to do it themselves, then it'd be more protracted throughout the summer, spraying it down and eradicating the weeds with a non-selective and then coming back in uh, with the desired grass species and seed in the fall. All right, thank you, Rock. All right, John, uh, this is an ash tree. This is in Ithaca. Uh, ash in the front yard. There's only one branch on the west side of the tree and it has a couple of pretty large holes in it. I th yep. They're concerned that if they remove the branch, it will leave the tree unbalanced. So they're wondering if they should take the branch or take the tree. So they're definitely right that, you know, having no branches on that one side of the tree, definitely unbalance it. And you also said the magic word ash. Mm -hmm. uh, as our entomologist friends will tell us about emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. um, basically, ash trees are on their way out. I, I might hear differently from my other horticulturalist friends because I know some that want to save all ash trees at whatever cost. But I would say this tree is on its way out and you just need to take it out because you're going to have to do some sort of treatment on it. It's going to be hundreds of dollars every year to just save it. So I would invest that 
and just rip the Band-Aid off. All right, excellent. And then your next set is also a Can This Tree Be Saved? This is in Omaha. This is a, an old Canadian red cherry, and it is a big one. Uh, now has some new damage, small holes that may be from a woodpecker. The tree is 18 inches in diameter. It's been, they've had a lot of black knot in it. They've trimmed it a lot. They wonder, can it be saved? Can it be treated? Or is this another one that needs to go to the wood pile? I think this is another one. If you see all that cracking there, and then you see underneath there's what looks like that light colored wood, that looks like dead to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the woodpecker damage, which I see there. So there's been insects in there. I think just so many problems here that you just need to remove it and start over because you're never, this tree is never gonna be happy here and it's never going to, to do well. I don't think I've ever, even heard of a Canada red cherry that big. So they've had a, a good long life out yes. of that one. And as we, a lot of people don't realize or think about, trees have a natural lifespan mm -hmm. and something that big has been there a long time and it's time to, mm -hmm. to let go. It's just release it into the, into the ether and, and start again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jody, you uh, were finished with pictures, but we have a question here that's probably on a lot of people's minds. We had a very strange winter in Nebraska, mm -hmm. 31 below in some locations mm -hmm. or lower. Mm -hmm. So they're wondering what sort of damage that did for especially our butterfly and our pollinator populations. Do we have any idea about that yet? Or is it too um, early? I don't know about the pollinators. I know that bagworms may have been affected, so that mm -hmm. might be a good good news because I know that there is a lethal temperature for that and we hit that on Valentine's Day. It, it has to be like negative 0 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours. So like every 36 hours we hit. Nice. So depending on where those bagworms were, they could, we could have less of them, which is good. So, mm -hmm. so we'll wait and see on the yeah. butterflies. And I think, yeah, I mean, the ones that migrate, they escaped. They kept it nice and warm down yeah. in Mexico. <laughs> yeah, we think. Yeah, so they've got other things ahead of them. Yeah, so. all right, good. Rock, this is a really interesting one. This is from uh, Pueblo in Colorado. Uh -huh. And um, gets hot and windy, of course. He's made it up his mind, really, to plant a new lawn, 20,000 square feet. He thinks he's leaning towards Sundancer, buffalo grass, and then Xena the zoysia. 12,000 square feet for one, 6,500 for the other. He's got everything all prepared. He knows his pH, he has underground sprinklers, but he's wondering the side of the house gets shaded through, throughout the day, which would be better there? That's number one. And is it possible to plant both buffalo and zoysia together? Will it look okay? Yeah, this is an individual that's obviously done their homework, right? And, and mm -hmm. Zenith is a seeded zoysia grass that's adapted um, to Pueblo, Colorado, definitely, and it's great to have people viewing from Colorado. Um, the, the blend, let's start with the blending of the two together. That would be technically called a mixture, two different species. But what intrigues me is that we don't know for sure, but we do know that when we blend you know, or, or mix bluegrass with fescue, when we get into the heavier shade, the fescue dominates. And when we are in the form or full sun, the bluegrass dominates. So in this case, zoysia grass, which has a very slow growing potential, but good shade tolerance might dominate in that heavier shade on the side of the house that's probably only getting, you know, four to six hours of sunlight on an, on an average Pueblo, Colorado day. So I'm intrigued with that idea. Um, you know, they are similar in texture, similar in color. So they probably would mix relatively easy together um, or, or, or be compatible with each other. But I've never heard of anyone doing that. And I'm gonna assure that the zoysia nuts out there will say, no, don't mix it with buffalo. And the buffalo people would say, do, not don't do it as well. But I'm thinking that's a great idea. And I like the fact that the person has done all their homework, they're ready. Uh, they mentioned that they have a sprinkler system. Both of those grasses will do fine, even in Pueblo with its, it's probably at about seven to eight inches a year. Even in that case, I'm gonna say that they probably need to back off the water once they get it established and just use that as a remedy or a rescue treatment when they get into that droughty period that Southern Colorado is typical of. I love that idea and I, I hope the viewer keeps us posted as to how that works out for them. I think we can make that happen. John, a lightning round question here from York, which is, they had a new drain field put in right up next to the garden. How far away should they put their vegetable garden from a leach field or a drain field? Well, you want a good distance away from there for food safety reasons. I, you know, I don't know the exact, but I, I would say at least 
30, 40, 50 feet away from that drain field because that can go out far into the ground. All right, excellent.